Hi, I'm Pastor Kathy from Tyner United Methodist Church. And I'm Pastor Jeff from Trinity United Methodist Church. And we've come to the fourth and final week of Advent. That means we're also on our last Sunday uh, worship service series, Christmas at Home. And during this series, we've been looking at the four different gospel Christmas stories as if they were homes. Yeah, and when we looked at this series, when we were planning it, we decided that we would kind of collaborate on the first two and then each write our own uh, messages. But we knew when we got closer to Christmas with more things going on that it might be better if we divided up the last two and um, each took one to preach on. So last week I took Luke's gospel and uh, did a message on it. And this week, Kathy's going to take John's gospel. And when we were talking about how this plan had worked out well uh, during this week, Jeff mentioned that, you know, it was good that I got John because John is kind of an off the wall, totally different um, experience than the other Gospels. And I wasn't quite sure how to take that. Um, yeah, uh, maybe this is a good time for us to, to start our worship service. Longing for God's presence and the promised Messiah, we light this candle for the one of peace, Jesus, our coming Savior and Lord. Lord, we open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit that, as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may leap in joy at your nearness and, like Mary, believe that there will be a fulfillment of what you speak to us today. Amen. Dear Father, help us appreciate Jesus' birth and incarnation. It is with awe and wonder that we affirm this mystery we can never fully comprehend. Guide us as together we seek to explore more deeply the gift of the Word made flesh. Though none of us has ever seen you, O Father, we respond with wonder and awe to the good news that your Son, who is close to your heart, has made you known to us. As we draw near the time when we celebrate the coming of your Son into the world, Make us ever more aware that the Word has been made flesh and dwells among us. Join with me now as we pray the words Jesus taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the glory, and the power, forever and ever. Amen. Hi children, this is Pastor Jeff. Uh, we just got our Christmas tree yesterday and we decorated it and it looks great. We've got ornaments and some of the ornaments on it are the ornaments that we talked about as my favorite ornaments. Do you like them? Uh, Jeff, I think you forgot something. Uh, what's, what's that, Kathy? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I forgot about the lights. We also put Christmas lights on the tree and you know, without light, you can't see anything. Well, the interesting thing in John's gospel is that he says when Jesus came into the world, he was the light of the world. And Jesus was the light to all people. And John says that we live in a world that can be dark and Jesus brings light into it. And we need light to see things correctly. We need light to see what's right. We need light to make our way. And so this Christmas, as we celebrate Jesus coming into the world, one of the things we can think about Jesus is that he's the light that came for us to light the way in our lives. Our Advent story today, kids, tells us that Jesus came into the world that Christmas as the light of the world to all people, and he came into a dark world. And Jesus came into a dark world, not meaning that he came into the world at night, but that he came into a world that sometimes is, uh, is mean, sometimes it's a bit scary, and he brought goodness and light into the world. Well, our, our gospel Christmas story this morning reminds me that I used to teach uh, science and I used to teach about light. And when you ask people how seeing works, how seeing a Christmas tree works, they would often tell you or draw it like this, that uh, this little girl is seeing the Christmas tree. And so she looks at the Christmas tree and then she goes out and sends her eyes out in some way and then she sees the Christmas tree. But that's not really the way seeing and light works, really the way light works is the Christmas tree sends its light into the girl's eyes and her eyes don't really see the Christmas tree at all. They get the light, they receive the light, but then they send the message up to the brain and the brain interprets it and that's how she sees the light. And I, I think that's an important lesson this Christmas when we think of Jesus as the light. It's really less about what we do. We need to focus on, on Jesus and we need to keep our minds on Jesus. But Jesus is the one that brings the goodness into our life and we need to receive that. We need to be focused on Jesus and receive that. But he's really the one that's sending out the goodness, giving the goodness, and all we need to do is just be open to focusing on him and receiving the goodness that he brings us as a gift this Christmas. Beneath the tree and see. 
Today's scripture, John chapter 1, verse 1 through 5 and 14. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. As Jeff's Uncle Bill often said, If you've heard this story before, don't stop me. I love to tell it. Like most children, I was afraid of the dark when I was young. My parents always left my door open a crack and the hall light on outside my room. However, when my parents went out for the evening, especially when my siblings were very young, they would hire an elderly couple to babysit for us. At least they seemed elderly, but they were probably younger than I am now. They were very no nonsense. There were no extra snacks, nor extra TV shows. When it was bedtime, Fern watched me brush my teeth and tuck me into bed. Then the sweet lady prayed with me. I feel as if I should put a trigger alert here or tell parents to cover their children's ears. She always said the prayer, now I lay me down to sleep. The lines have since been revised, but back in the day they went, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Fern would then turn off the light, close the door, and leave me alone in the dark. No matter how much I begged, she didn't leave the door open with the hall light on. I was left alone in the dark with my wild imagination and the third line of the prayer lingering in my mind. If I should die before I wake. I don't ruminate on the line from the prayer at this point in my life, but there are nights I lie awake in the dark with my vivid imagination and the worries of life lingering in my mind. When that happens, I do my best to concentrate on the light of the world to calm and quiet my soul. Our 2020 Advent worship series is rooted in the four gospel Christmas stories as described by Cynthia Campbell in her book, Christmas in the Four Gospel Homes. The book looks at the different perspectives of Christmas in each of the four gospels and what each one can teach us. Architect Kevin Burns has illustrated the four gospel homes. You can see his renditions on the screen. The first week we visited Mark's Gospel home, which completely skips over the first Christmas and Jesus' birth. Mark's perspective on what's important about Jesus' birth is that he was born to die for our sins on the cross. Burns' image of Mark's home is a simple cabin. The second week we visited Matthew's Gospel home, a big rambling Victorian in Burns' illustration. It's a house where generation after generation has gathered because Matthew's Gospel begins by tracing Jesus' ancestry through Jewish history and reminding us Jesus is part of a royal line. Last week, we took a trip to Luke's home with a wide front porch and animals on the lawn. Burns used his grandparents' house in rural Kentucky as the model for Luke's home because it was a place of positive memories. It was a house that invited people to be with or to become part of a family. Luke's perspective on the first Christmas is rich in detail and probably the one with which most people are familiar. This week, we're going to John's Gospel home. Here's how Kevin Burns describes his illustration. John's house reflects the boldness of John's Gospel and contrasts with the more traditional houses of the other Gospels. It's a modern house with lots of glass, and unlike the other homes, it's in a night scene. It's the only illustration with color in it. The light shining through its windows is like an invitation to come inside and explore. The house is not just a new combination of the traditional elements. It presents a bold new way of expressing the essence of a home. Modern architecture and design can bring out strong feelings. Usually people love it or hate it. While Jeff likes more traditional looking homes or cabins, 
I love modern architecture. I've loved the opportunity living in Trinity's mid-century modern parsonage has given me to change up my decorating style. This gospel home illustration is by far my favorite. On the welcome video, Jeff and I talked about how when we were um, congratulating ourselves about our plan for dividing up this worship series, um, and then Jeff said something like this, John is so different and out there compared to the other gospels. It's perfect for you, Kathy. Now I'd like to believe that meant my husband knows how much I like modern architecture rather than that I am weird. However, the truth is Jeff knows John is my favorite gospel precisely because of how different, quirky, and off the beaten path John's perspective is compared to the other gospels. In the words of Kevin Burns, the gospel of John is not so much another story about a man who is trying to teach us what God is about. It is a gospel that presents a man who actually is the essence of God. While Mark's gospel story begins well after Jesus' birth, when John the Baptist is a grown man beginning his ministry of preparation, Luke's story begins several months, or perhaps a year, before Jesus' birth, with the angel announcing to John's astonished father that he and his wife would have a son in their old age. Matthew takes us back 42 generations, all the way to Jesus' ancestor Abraham, born centuries earlier. But John's gospel goes back way further, to the very beginning of time. As we heard in the scripture reading, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If the opening words of John's gospel sound familiar, it is because they echo the first words of Genesis at the very beginning of the Bible. John reminds us that the story of Jesus doesn't start when he came to earth as a baby that first Christmas, taking human form. Jesus' story of redemption traces back to when there was only God. According to Cynthia Campbell, the opening lines of John's gospel are the first things that most people learn when they begin to study Greek. God, word, life, darkness, light. But while the words may seem simple, each has a deep meaning. John tells us three important things at the start of his gospel. First, Jesus is the word. John refers to Jesus as the word and tells us that all things were made through him. How did the world come into being? God used words. He spoke and creation began. God used words to give his law to Moses and the prophets of the Old Testament spoke the word of the Lord to the people. At the beginning of our world, the word was embedded in creation. And in John 1, 14, John announces his take on the birth of Jesus that first Christmas. And it's this, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John also tells us that in Jesus is life. In John's gospel, Jesus teaches us that the life he offers is meant to be more than just breathing. His life is abundant and eternal. To receive this type of life, we must be born anathen, which Campbell defines as a Greek word that means both again and from above, or from God. We are born into the life Jesus calls us to when we believe in and trust him, the word that was with God in the beginning. In John's gospel, Jesus describes this type of life again and again throughout the whole gospel. It's one of the last things he says to his disciples to prepare them before his arrest and death. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. When Jesus offered his life for our sins, it was to restore our broken relationship with God and make a way for us to become fully alive. In Jesus was life, and that life was the light of all people. John's gospel is often called the gospel of light and life. And back in Genesis, creation begins with God declaring, let there be light. John tells us Jesus came into the world to be the light that shines in the darkness. He is a light that the darkness of the world cannot destroy, nor can it fully understand. 
John tells us that Jesus, this all-powerful light, became a human and lived among us. He became Emmanuel, God with us. In the children's message diagram, we learn that the way light works is that the lights on the Christmas tree were actually sending particles of light into the girl's eyes. If her eyes are open, she receives the light from the tree and her brain can process it. Jesus is always sending his light to us, but we have to be open to receiving it. As I mentioned earlier, John's gospel is not as straightforward as the others. Here's the way Cynthia Campbell describes John's gospel home. The first problem in visiting John's house is finding it. The directions are a little sketchy. The house is set far off the main road. And once you find the driveway, you wind down a long, dark road, go up a hill, and there it is, a fabulous home that looks as if it is made out of light, a light that shines in the deep darkness, end quote. We may have to work a little harder with John's gospel, but one thing this gospel can teach us is that as our relationship with Jesus grows, so does our perspective on life and its challenges. Those of you who are my age and younger might not totally appreciate this next example Campbell gives us, because to us, it's probably the way we've always seen the earth. But before 1962, when John Glenn orbited the earth and sent back photos, people had never seen the earth as a bright sphere suspended in the total darkness of space. This new perspective changed the way people thought about our planet. Today, this image of the blue, big blue marble is taken for granted by most people. It's just the way we see it. But when we come to know Jesus, we get a totally new perspective on life. It's as if we were in a dark room and suddenly someone turned on the lights, allowing us to see. We see the good parts of life we might take for granted, and we see more clearly the sinful parts of our life that need to change if we are to be fully alive in Christ. In order to embrace this new way of life, we can't be afraid to look at the light. When Pastor Jeff preached on Luke's gospel last week, he focused on weariness. The weariness of the people in Luke's gospel likely felt that first Christmas, and the weariness that many of us feel after so many months of dealing with new routines, information, losses, and restrictions. We've all been challenged to look at things from different perspectives this year. We can't begin to count the perspective shifts we've had to navigate. And that is difficult and tiring. It can make us weary. In an article for the Gospel Coalition called A Word of Hope for the Exhausted, it's linked on our DIY worship page on the website, Clarissa Mull writes that at this time of the year, it gets darker earlier, and many of us simply want to go to bed. We want to close our eyes to the struggles with our jobs, finances, and pandemic worries. We want to shut out the world and, quote, slip into hibernation mode until the winter and the weary year has passed, end quote. Does that resonate with anyone else? Let's just close our eyes on 2020 and wake up in 2021. Mal says the cure for these feelings of weariness is not in closing our eyes, but in opening them to see God's wisdom, goodness, and power. Opening our eyes to see the Holy Spirit who comforts us in times of trouble and intercedes for us when all we can manage is groans. Opening our eyes to look at Jesus, the light of the world, who can dispel the darkness with his light. Jesus, the light of the world, is always there. But as we saw in the children's message with the light from the Christmas tree, our eyes have to be open to receive Jesus' light. That's difficult to do when we are weary and mourned by the challenges and cares of this world. But in a world that can be dark, our hope is having our eyes open to the light that came to dwell among us that first Christmas. As we anticipate the birth of Christ coming ever closer this week, I pray that as we see a light from an Advent candle, a Christmas tree, an over-the-top light display, or a fireplace, we would remember that Jesus, the light of the world, is sending his light to us. Open your eyes and receive it. Amen.
to him who by means of his power working in us is able to do so much more than we can ever ask for or even think of. To God be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ for all time, forever and ever. Amen.